Hey guys, it's Doc from the Gold Hog, and today I'm going to take you along on a little trip and I'm going to explain something about what we're doing. First, we're going to take the hog pan with us today, but I wanted to explain about the hog pan because the hog pan really isn't a gold pan per se. The hog pan really is a primary, high volume, self classifying, fluidized concentrator system that allows you to do over half a ton an hour. In restricted areas where you can only use a gold pan or for people that want to do sort of remote uh, let's say testing in different areas and they want to do it real quickly so let's get that let's get that straight it's really not just a gold pan you use a regular finishing or regular gold pan along with this it's a primary concentrator and it's really really fast I want you to understand that first next I want you to understand that I'm gonna talk about I'm going to talk about gold deposits and I'm going to talk about rivers and I'm going to talk about different areas of the country and I'm going to show you some stuff. Now, don't get too specific on this. I'm going to generalize a little bit because I'm going to talk about the Southeast, I'm going to talk about uh, Canada, I'm going to talk about California. But you got to be careful when I start to talk about some of this stuff or I have to be careful. I start to talk about things about those different sizes of waterways and the power of waterways. So I talk about smaller creeks versus larger rivers. But I want you to be careful because a lot of times when you see some of these smaller creeks, there's a good chance that they could have been 10 times that size way back, thousands and thousands of years ago. You just don't know. I like to say a lot of people, a lot of people, to sort of put it in perspective, I say, see that 30 foot tree there? That thing was underwater tens of thousands of years ago or whenever when there was a huge river flowing through here. So you can't make assumptions on what you see today. And that's why testing is so important. We're going to go to some of these smaller creeks, but I often, I back off from these creeks and I'll go to Google Maps and I'll put in terrain features and I'll look what was there a long time ago. In other words, is there ravine, are there ravines on both sides and is, was this a primary flood zone and waterway thousands and thousands of years ago that I can't see right now? But I really want to concentrate on today and what I want you to learn from today's video is I want you to learn the importance of, of hydraulic power. In other words, I call it the crushing machine. And that's really what water is, and that's what placer gold is. Placer gold is low deposits, or deposits within those quartz veins, that over time is eventually just crushed out and crushed out through water, through other rocks. It's just a crushing process, and we're crushing and we're crushing. The bigger the waterway, like some of these huge rivers, like the American River in California, like the Fraser River up in Canada, some of these big old waterways that go through gold country contain a huge amount of fine gold. You can take a panful, it's amazing, you go up there and you take a panful and you'll have 20, 30, 40, 50 colors in a panful just sitting on a creek, but it's just full of this fine gold. A lot of areas, like in Georgia, we can go up to, we can go up to banks and we can take a panful and maybe, if we're lucky, find one color in four pans. But I'm going to take you to a spot in Georgia that actually sort of mimics one of these big rivers and has this big crushing area and this big deposits. It's pretty cool. But it's a good way, um, this is a good way, and this is why I like the hog pan, because I can go out to a certain area and I can real quickly test a good volume. In other words, instead of just doing a couple pans, I can move a couple of buckets within a matter of 10 minutes and I can get a real good test for an area. The other thing is, is crevicing. You know, we talk about crevicing a lot. Well, we don't do a lot of crevicing in the southeast and there's a reason for it. We don't have these huge rivers that are bringing down and moving this whole big amount of gold over all these big crevices and bedrocks. We just don't do that. You can go out in Georgia and you can crevice in Georgia. And let me tell you what, you can spend a whole day crevicing. If you come out with a few pieces of gold, you're lucky, especially on these smaller rivers and smaller creeks. It's just we do not really have a lot of crevicing here. You can sometimes get lucky and find some, but it's not like California where you see people go out and they're crevicing for gold out there and they're finding, they're pulling out picker after picker after nugget after nugget. It just doesn't happen around here like that. So let's talk real quick. I'm going to take you over. I'm going to do a couple things real quick and I'm going to show you something about rocks. I'm going to show you something about load deposits. Let's talk about placer gold. Let's talk about how it's formed, the crushing power of water. I'm going to show you some actual load deposit gold and quartz. I'm going to just crush it up with a hammer and just show you that this is what happens with the power of water real quick. You'll get a better feel for it. Okay, so here's the idiot's explanation of how gold becomes placer gold. 
here is a uh, piece of quartz that has good mineral deposits inside of it. I am taking the rock, putting it here. My rock crusher is not here, so I can't do it. Putting a t-shirt down. Oh, I don't know where this is from. And then, literally, crushing this rock down to fine powder in here. Now, this is stupid, of course. You always want to wear safety glasses if you do this, but I am taking this, I'll pull aside the larger ones, and I'll crush it with a hammer, and I'm getting this down to a powder. I'm just doing this for you, just so you can see. So there's the rock. Here comes Mr. River. This is the river and rocks rolling over it for thousands of years, crushing it and making it into that fine sand that you see on the side of the banks. Now I'm going to take this powder and I'm going to scoop it up. I'm going to scoop it up and I'm going to put it into the pan. And now I'm going to go pan it out, see if there's anything in here. I think you can see it, but there's one, two, three, and there's actually a fourth piece of fine gold in there. There's one, two, three. So I've got three pieces of probably sub 100 mesh gold. Actually, there's four. One, two, three, four, five pieces. Five pieces from that one little rock that I crushed up. There's five pieces of little gold. Now we do find when we crush these rocks, we've actually been out crushing some of them and we do find larger gold in it. But this is just a good example of how that fine placer gold gets put into the stream. And you can see it there. So I just crushed up one of these rocks and you can see it releasing gold. Crush the rock down with water and hydraulic force and you'll get gold. And so now we're talking about the power of water, but I want you to look at something real quick. So let's take a rock. This is just a regular broken off rock of quartz. Now I want you to see what water will do over time. So over time, you know, 100 years or whatever it is, of those rocks moving through, look how smooth they are. Now they've started to wear weather and started to round and tumble. So basically, un unweathered, weathered rock. Now let's go over to the larger ones. Here's a piece of larger rock. Beautiful. Look at that mineral deposit in there. But now I want you to see another rock. Look at this rock. Now that's a heavy rock. Now how much water power would you have to have to make this thing tumble and tumble and tumble for thousands of years to make this thing all round and weathered like this. Now imagine one of these that's a foot or two foot around. We find those big round rocks all the time. So the power of water is such a good indicator of what's going to happen in your stream. And I really like you to look for this. I like you to look for those round quartz rocks. It's a very good indicator for us. Okay. And a lot of people have heard me say I can tell the difference between gold from the areas that it comes, but it, it can especially tell not so much on fine, fine gold, because fine gold will move, but especially once you start to get into the medium and larger gold. And I want you to look at these two nuggets here. Excuse the bird in the background. But can you tell which one came from where? Well, this is a Georgia nugget, and this is a Canada nugget. And you can see that this is rounded and smooth, and this is really more jagged in here. So this looks worn. This one doesn't. Let me turn them over a little bit. Again, smooth, unsmooth, worn, not worn. But this one broke out of the load and just sat there and didn't move. This one broke out of a load deposit and was tumbling and tumbling and tumbling and tumbling. And that area again, we talk about the difference between big water, small water movement. Hey guys, it's Doc from the Gold Hog. And today I'm going to take you on a little adventure and show you a little bit about Georgia prospecting. I'm, I'm actually going to be working the hog pan for the first time actually up in the national forest because nothing else is legal there except for a pan so for the first time we can actually take something up there that we can move material I'm gonna go up there by myself uh, the guys are down there they'll be running today 
that uh, they're going to be running down here. Um, so I'm going to actually take you up there. I'm going to show you some of that. It's a pretty cool little area. It's way remote up in the mountains. And then I'm going to come back here. And today what we're going to do is, is I'm going to show you the hog pan. We're going to go to Crushing Corner. I'm going to talk to you the difference about big rivers and little creeks and the gold deposits and how they work in. So I'm trying to tie this in. I just, I want to, I figured I'd show the hog pan working while we're out here doing this stuff. But at the same time, I wanted to talk about why some creeks are productive and some are just not. But this is especially for the southeast. But I talk about Canada, California, Alaska, different areas too. So it might help you out. Hey guys, it's Doc. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ugh. Done a little hiking this morning and uh, I probably put in probably about five miles of hiking, exploring different areas and trying to find a decent spot. Uh, we're up in the National Forest. You have to make sure that you're not in WMAs, that you're not in restricted areas or in state parks, so it's real hard to find certain areas. So. Uh, actually, this area is actually right off a road, so I mean, I can actually see my truck through here, which is kind of nice. And uh, a lot of people come hunting up here. There's a little campfire spot up here. But nice little babbling brook in here. Got a big steep ridge back in here. Hey, this is the first time we got the hog pan. I got everything. I got everything I could possibly need in my back. I got a finishing pan. I've got my hog pan. I've got folding trowels. I've got a little folding shovel. It's still classified as a hand trowel. Um, I've got emergency gear if I need it, GPS, everything. So, plus I'm having to pack in camera equipment, so it's not an easy hike. Try it when you're over 50. So, anyways, pretty little creek here. I see some gravels. I see some cobbles. I'll give it a shot and see what happens. But a nice little area. There's a big cliff up over here. There's mountain laurels up in here. Real pretty comes down it goes way up here but this is sort of a cliff in here and I'm trying to be careful because these rocks are slippery and there are snakes around here so typically if you stay in the water and let me give you a tip here's one of my tips we hike in with mountain boots but in my pack I have a pair let me show you this is a pair of my scuba diving boots and they have soles on them, just like a regular boot. But I, I, take the, I take my mountain boots off and I put these on so I don't get my boots all wet. But you can see this area, it's real pretty up here. There's some nice looking stuff up here. There's a nice little cobble area right in there I should probably test. I just don't want to bust my butt getting up there, but that's real pretty. Bunch of down trees. I might grab a scoop of that stuff up there. bust my butt doing this you can see what I've done here I got these massive rocks and everything in here so that right there is probably about 10 pans if I had a pan 7 to 10 pans worth that I can process down now in 15 seconds pretty cool So you can see, I've taken about three, three gallons of material 
we got it down to this, so pretty cool. So anyways, no gold here. But it shows you how quickly you can sample that stuff. Run through it like that, now I can move. All right, so now I'm going into a little inside bend I found with some gravels on the bank. Not on the bank, but on the shoal. And it's a lot muddier. So let's see what happens. Well, guess what, boys and girls? I found my first piece of Georgia National Forest gold out here. I went back over in here. I'm finding almost no black sand in this creek. I'm seeing there are a couple pieces of quartz rock over here, not much. There's a pool back over here. But I had to run... I probably had to run three five gallon buckets to find me one piece of gold. So <laughs> I'm gonna show it to you. I'm gonna make it into a big piece of jewelry. And there it is. I did see also, I saw two more pieces in here that were about 200 mesh. But this is obviously not a gold creek. That's pretty apparent. So uh, we're not going to waste our time here. Beautiful area, beautiful creek. I'll show you some of the surroundings around here. But let me tell you what, if I had to do this with a pan, I mean, I'm trying to give you the perspective that if I fill up this gold pan and have to pan it out every single time I fill it up, I would have been here for an hour doing what I did in probably 10 minutes. Because I can fill this up seven to 10 times and put it in the hog pan and just concentrate down the hog pan. I'm not even using the UR mat in the hog pan. I'm just running it bare. So. But I did see I found that one little piece, which is kind of ugly, but I did find uh, two other, one or two other little, like, 200s. I mean, if this was a gold creek, I'd be scoping in here and finding, in Georgia, for these kind of creeks, these small water creeks, you'd probably find three or four pieces per, per load full. That would be pretty good, and then you got to start working. Hey guys, one thing I wanted to talk to you today about is too, I wanted to talk about deposits and I wanted to talk about inside bends and so forth. And I have a great opportunity to teach you something out here today. You know, we talk about inside bend and outside bends, but very rarely do you see a 180 bend. We call this the S turn because it literally the river comes in and does a full 180 almost over here. But what it does is it presents, and I've shown this before, but it presents this huge sand pile almost. But it gives a wonderful demonstration of how heavy things drop out fast on the upper end or the front end. So I want to show that to you. So let me step back a little bit. So we just packed in. We're, we're going to be running the hog pan here today because we're battling thunderstorms. We know they're coming. 
But I want you to look at this. This the river comes in and it does a complete almost 180 all through here and then deposits back and goes back down here. But here's the beautiful thing about this for teaching wise. I want you to look at this sandbar or this corner. Now this is not the bank, this is actually a gravel deposit. So if you look over here, the whole back side of this is fine sand over here. And then as you go forward, what happens? You start to get your bigger cobbles over here. So let's look at it close. Here you have all fine sands and small little gravels. And then as you start to go up, look what happens. Look what happens to all the cobbles. They get larger and larger, and this becomes almost a hard pack in here to the point where, look at the size of that rock. Look at the size of that rock. So this is a great little demonstration of how this inside bend in here, as it comes around, it slows down and everything that wants to deposit will deposit here. Hydraulic equivalence. If you don't understand hydraulic equivalence, watch the video on hydraulic equivalence. But this is such a great little learning tool and such a great demonstration of just nature at work doing its natural depositation based on, let's say, the weight or hydraulic equivalence. Things that are hydraulically equivalent will deposit in the same place. Heavy large rocks will deposit here gold will deposit here and especially any of your bigger gold will probably be in this area up here <clears throat> what's hydraulically equivalent to the smaller finer lighter stuff the real fine gold so you'll find a lot of fine gold up here now i will tell you <clears throat> this is one of the only places in georgia that i know about this one corner because it's a 180 that i can go and i can take a pan full of dirt and i can find five colors I can go into any creeks because we don't have big rivers really in Georgia that are gold rich rivers like the American River in California, like the Fraser River up towards up in Canada and that way. Those are huge rivers when you see these huge boulders like in Montana, Colorado, California, Alaska, you'll see these huge big boulders in the creek and their creek is just made of these huge boulders. We don't have that in Georgia and a lot of places don't have it. So that's why we really, in those areas, you can take a pan and you can actually find 30 to 50 colors per panful. Here, you just don't get that. In Georgia and in these smaller creeks, especially in the southeast, you go take a panful and if you find one color in that panful, you'll be lucky. Really lucky. So the other day, I don't know where I'm going to put it in the video, the other day I went on a hike up in the mountains just to show you that I'm in gold country and I'm working these small creeks. And I'm having trouble finding even one color in those because they're small creeks. They're not big river channels. It changes completely. There's a huge difference between these large, monstrous, hydraulic beasts, these large rivers, and small creeks that very seldom move. The next thing I want to talk to you about real quick is I want to talk to you about what the gold looks like. Because we don't have these big rivers, the gold doesn't travel miles and miles and miles and get tumbled and tumbled and tumbled. So the, the gold in Georgia, once it breaks loose out of that load deposit here, it breaks, it wears down the quartz and breaks loose, it typically doesn't move that much. That's why we have a lot of coarse gold here. When you go up to like Canada, Alaska, California, Montana, where you have, and you're on a big river, those things, that gold moves and constantly moves. Over thousands of years, it'll move miles and miles and miles. It tumbles. That's why you look at the gold, it's all flat and it's all rounded and worn. Our gold in Georgia does not look that way, I'll tell you right now. Um, it does not look worn. It actually looks pretty, sharp edges, and it's just not worn. So anyways, today we're going to go up here, we're going to use the hog pan, we're going to do some tests up here just to show you. Hey guys, real quick, I'm going to show you, um, a lot of people say, well, it's heavy, it's going to hurt my back. There's a difference between the hog pan and, the gold, and a regular gold pan. When you use a regular gold pan, you're using your back, and there's no way to sort of brace yourself. Well, I'm going to show you with a hog pan, because it's shoulder width apart, what you can do is, is you just squat or sit on a bucket. You just squat and rest your elbows on your thigh just above your knee. It takes all the weight, and you just, you're just working your hands real light. So let me show you that real quick. You notice quick. my legs are spread apart here. And what I do when I have the material in the pan, I put my elbows right above my knee on my thigh. And that way I just have them um, just fingertips. Even with 40 pounds, 30 pounds of material, I'm just running fingertips. So watch how I do this real quick. I got about 20 pounds of material. I'm going to set my elbows right on my thigh, 
just like this, I'm sitting in a chair, pretending I'm sitting in a chair, and all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna rock it with my fingertips. I'm barely holding, I could do this with two fingers. Very comfortable. Don't use your back. Just squat, put your elbows on your thighs. And that's how you do it. Again, all you want to do is squat, sit in a chair, put your elbows right on your thighs, and work the pan back and forth. Okay, so here's the beauty of this. I can take this. Normally, this is about five, four to five regular gold pans worth of material. All I'm going to do is I'm going to submerge and shake, wash it, and basically dump. That's all I'm going to do. And concentrate it down. So all I'm going to do is, while I submerge it, I'm going to shake. And then I'm going to lift up. And now you'll see that all my rocks are clean. And now I'm just going to dump the rocks out. And now trapped inside of here is about one cup worth of heavies and gold down in here. And now I'm ready for the next, my next load. So you can see, I mean the size rocks we're putting into this and we're washing these big rocks too. Merge, shake. Okay, so now what I've done is I've concentrated down a five gallon bucket. It's right about a quart. If I wanted to work it down in the, gold, in the hog pan more, I could, but I'm working with really fine gold here, so I'm just getting it concentrated down. So now I have a quart to pan, so now I'll pan it. And I think my battery's gonna run out pretty soon, so I'm gonna shut this off while I pan it. All right, so unlike yesterday when I was working that stream, where I didn't have a whole lot of black sand, I want you to see the amount of black sand I have from one five gallon bucket that was only about three quarters full. I've panned it down and look at all that black sand. I mean, there's a lot of black sand in there. So that's telling me that there should be some gold in here. Not much. This isn't, this isn't the Yukon, this is Georgia. So let's take a look. All right, so here's where it gets interesting. Yesterday we were up in the mountains and I did, uh, we, I was up in the mountains and I did bucket after bucket after bucket and I found, finally found one piece of gold. Now I want you to look at this. I barely moved three quarters of a bucket in, what was that Alex, three minutes, five minutes, something like that, yeah, without my babbling in there. Now look at this. <clears throat> I'm sure hoping you can see that. There's a nice piece of wire gold in there. There's all kinds of fine gold. There's close to probably 30 pieces of gold in here. Now I've got some floating too, so I gotta be careful. I wanna shade it out so you can see it a little bit. Anyone that knows Georgia will tell you that's amazing for three quarters of a bucket. I mean, there's gold all up there. That's unreal. Look at it all float now. It's all floating on the jet dry. That's just unreal for one bucket. I've never seen that in my life out here in Georgia. One bucket of one one three quarters of a bucket of material, and I've got probably 30, 40 colors. Got a piece of wire gold. That's unreal. Just off, just off one of these, and there's a big gravel bar over here, and we're just working this thing over here. 
That's amazing. <laughs> All right, Alex has been out, how long you been out here working with me? Years now. Yeah. Okay, this is the first time you've seen a five gallon bucket of this stuff run. Mm -hmm. And what was your first reaction? <laughs> what did you, no, you said holy <laughs> shit or yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, that's crazy. That was, that, that's how big the hole is, it was dug. Well, I haven't, done, I haven't run the other bucket yet. Oh yeah, true. I only ran one of the buckets. <laughs> so I guess that's a good reaction to tell you. If you find the right place, if you learn about deposits, if you learn that bigger rivers like this, for Georgia, this is a pretty good sized river up here, and then later on it goes to a bigger. But this travels through gold country. That's point number one. You gotta have gold near the river or in, in the ground. Point number two, the bigger the river that's running through the gold, the more of that fine gold in those deposits you'll find. When we get up like in the mountains of Georgia and then those little creeks, and you'll bust your butt. That's why everyone went to California during the gold rush. It's because they learned those big rivers carry so much more gold. Most of North Georgia's real gold that was produced really was done load mining. They were drilling and they were tunneling. There was a lot of load mines. And when they found out in California, you could go out to the streams and just pick gold out of the streams, out of like the American River and those big rivers out there. Guess where everyone went? So. The, the southeast is completely different from somewhere like Montana, California, Alaska, Canada. Totally different experience. another five gallon bucket that time I didn't empty in between each one um, there is a lot of clay here so that bottom chamber will fill up if it's fine gold and I've got a lot of clay I like to empty it every one or two pans but you can go if it's just river gravels um, you can go a whole five gallon bucket I just like to be careful Whew. okay well we're not gonna battle these thunderstorms anymore there's a band coming in so but I wanted to show you we ran Three buckets of material, not even full buckets, three quarters full. What'd that take us, Alex? It'd be like eight minutes? Yeah. I mean, I even stopped and let Alex do it because he had never run it before and he just bam, right away, just knew what to do just from watching me. But I want to show you. Again, this is Georgia. <laughs> and this is, this. what I'm going to show you here in this pan, for some people it doesn't look like a lot of gold, but if you've ever prospected in Georgia, I've seen people get this amount of gold in an entire day. And a lot of this is 200, 150, 100 mesh gold. But you can see it right there. But I want you to look. And there's another piece of wire gold in here somewhere. But all through here, back in here, there's gold up in here. There's got to be, I would say, 100 pieces of gold in here from three buckets of material on this, what we call crushing corner out here. And, and that's just, that's just truly, look at the size of that stuff. That's just truly amazing there. But again, that's why I love this hog pan. You can come out, concentrate down super quick, throw it into a finishing pan, finish it off, or just pull the concentrates out. Again, we reduced five three gallon buckets down to maybe a gallon and a half two gallons that we could carry out of here or i'd even even if i had a little recirculating sluice i could set up if i wasn't allowed to run stream sluices here i could run a little recirculating sluice and run those through a little recirculating sluice do whatever i wanted to but the main thing is i haven't had to classify i'm washing all those big rocks that might have gold on them they're all going through in that pan i'm not kicking anything out 
If you're going to classify, you need to wet classify. That's a pain in the butt to wet classify. You don't have to do it with this. This is a wet classifier super concentrator. Really cool. Hey guys, thanks for coming along. I hope you learned something today. The main thing I want you to understand is I want you to understand the effects of water, how it affects gold deposits, how it actually placer gold is actually formed, how it's crushed up, but really how to better understand the different size waterways that you're looking at too. And remember, you just never know what's underneath too. We're looking at this, we're looking at these flood deposits and we're finding a bunch of fine gold up on the top, but we don't know what's down underneath under the bedrock too. So that's real important. There's a big difference between what you're seeing up on top and what you're seeing on the little bends versus what's down deep and on the bedrock. So make sure you check both. Not only the upper deposits along those, along those gravel bars, but also eventually get down and actually look down towards the bedrock. That's typically where we're gonna find our best gold. Thanks for coming along, Doc from the Gold Hog.